us and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We love to do the dance of authority, the dance of ritualized transaction of giving and receiving of authority and power. And in our culture, in our time, we particularly like to take every opportunity to resist that dance and to misunderstand the signs whenever we can. If you don't believe me, take a look at the internet where everybody's an expert on everything and all opinions are valued uh, equally even though they are clearly not all equal. The fact is that in our culture we grant authority reluctantly and punish pretensions to power severely. For example, you cannot expect in our society to pretend to be a lawyer, a doctor, or a police officer without some pretty severe civil repercussions. This resistance, though, uh, collapses pretty quickly as soon as push comes to shove. When you have that weird lump on your skin, you, you probably don't want to just go to the internet and look up what it might be. You actually want to talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. This all brings up the question, how does authority work in our own kingdom of God? Uh, clearly, it's not the sort of thing where a piece of paper on the wall says that you know anything about God's will or way of being. We have three stories today that seem to plug into this. The first that I'll talk about is Matthew. So in the Matthew story that we have today, there's a bit of context that's helpful. Uh, first of all, the beginning of this chapter is the Palm Sunday section, where Jesus tells his disciples to go into town, get him a donkey, come back, and he comes into the city enacting a great ritual of power. Uh, he's taking the role of the king, the messianic figure, coming back to perhaps kick out the Romans and to take his place as the priest in the temple. Uh, he's lauded by the crowds, he's greeted by children, uh, they put down the palms at his way, and his first stop is the temple where he lays down the gauntlet. This is the scene where he makes a whip of cords and he drives out the money lenders and he upturns the tables and he makes a ruckus. After that, he quickly retreats, probably for a good reason, and he goes to a hill overlooking the, the city. And that's when we have the cursing of the fig tree incident that you might recall from Matthew. It also occurs in Mark. This is the scene where Jesus sees a fig tree. And in Mark's version, uh, it's out of season. In Matthew's, you're just supposed to know that. But anyway, the fig tree is not even in the season for giving figs. But Jesus is upset that there's no fig trees there. And so he curses it, and it withers and dies, which the disciples are pretty impressed by. And so they ask, how, how does this happen? And Jesus essentially tells them, if you had faith, you could do this too. That's a really strange story. I mean, this poor fig tree, what did it do wrong, right? But it makes more sense if we consider the fig tree as a metaphor for the temple itself, that even though it was resplendent and beautiful with leaves, like the fig tree had leaves, somehow it was not bearing true fruit. It was not actually bearing the fruit of repentance and of godliness that was expected to be. So he comes back into town, into the temple, and this is when the confrontation happens with the authorities of the temple. And you can imagine why. I mean, after all this stuff, after all these little moves in the dance of authority that he's done, not just the uh, showing up on a donkey fighting in the streets in Palm Sunday fashion, but also the whole uh, incident with the, uh, the cleansing of the temple, you know, he's doing some pretty big things here, and they have every right to ask him for his ID, his credentials, as it were. And he doesn't exactly answer them. You may notice this is sort of a non-answer. What he does do is he aligns himself with John the Baptist, another great rabble-rouser, another one who didn't exactly have a piece of paper from a great credential rabbi on his wall. This was another radical figure who was known by his action more than his rhetoric. That seems to be a theme that Jesus picks up in his passage, that this uh, parable that he tells about the two sons. There's something here about the doing being important. It's about the doing and not simply the saying. If we imagine that God had given the gift of Torah to the people of Israel, and in particular to the priesthood to uphold through the temple system, if they were not doing the Torah, if they were just saying the Torah, then like the fig tree, they bear no fruit. And Jesus is right in his condemnation. So that's one power of how authority works in the kingdom. One sort, sorry, how authority works in the kingdom. Another is this beautiful Philippians passage. That section that, that begins, um, let the same light be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was, uh, 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 who though he was born with the quality of God and not required for quality, that's something to be exploited. That section, uh, is actually probably from a hymn that was sung by the Christian community. So it's even older than this writing of Paul's letter here. This is a very old hymn that was sung by the early Christians. And it says something about emptiness. The Greek word kenosis is uh, thrown around a lot. There's something about this emptiness that we're supposed to experience. Somehow that is coming into line with God's will for us. And that by doing this, Jesus entered the will of God, and God worked through him. 
similar kind of idea seems to be at work in the uh, Moses section. So, you know, they've spent about 40 years at this point wandering through the deserts of sin, as it says, and, and they're wandering around, and now they've had all these miraculous experiences already. They have plenty of evidence that God is blessing them and wants them to be free and to visit the promised land. Uh, first of all, there was the whole, you know, winning the freedom from uh, Egypt. Then there was the, uh, the crossing of the Red Sea incident. Then there was the manna in the wilderness. It's like, what do these people want? And, of course, they complain. Uh, one preacher points out that, of course, it's not evidence that they want. It's personal satisfaction. And they get it in a, in a form. Moses is told by God to strike the rock with his staff, the same staff he used to liberate the people, that sort of staff that had brought disease and pestilence to the Egyptians, now brings blessings to the people of Israel. But this isn't done through Moses' power. This is really important. God says he will be in front of Moses, as it were, kind of at that intersection between Moses and the rock, and the water comes out, the true living water. So what do we get when we put these three stories of how power works in the kingdom of God together? What are we to understand? I think one thing that's immediately apparent is this is a, something about doing, not simply saying, that this is not some sort of an authority that comes to us simply because we can say something. But this is an authority that's evident in action, in being. Second, I think we can say that it's something about getting out of the way and letting God work through us. In all of these stories, we have instances where God's power is manifest, but it's God's power, not the person's personal power. For example, when Jesus uh, curses the fig tree and he's challenged on how he did that, Jesus answered them, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, you lift it up and throw it into the sea, it will be done. Whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive. Notice he didn't say, whatever you want will happen. He says, whatever you ask for in prayer, you will receive. In other words, it's by God's power that this action will happen. So this is a bit of an open-ended sermon. At this point, I'm going to kind of toss it out and get some more uh, definition on these ideas about how power works in God's kingdom. I've set up a few things, these examples that I think we can draw from, but I'd like to hear from you. How do you think God's power works in God's kingdom? It's clearly not the kind of power that goes with being a lawyer, a doctor, or a, uh, a police officer. It's something else. God's power works in our weakness. Uh, I mean, even though we look at the people of Israel and say, oh, you know, why would you have any faith? In actual fact, they are looking to their leader, who then looks to God for a solution to their own weakness. And, and uh, you know, Moses doesn't want to, doesn't know what to do. He's weak, and so it's God's power that, that brings Absolutely. So has anyone had this experience where it was when they were really able to surrender and have and to embrace the weakness that the solution came? Oh, that's cool. I see Cam and Bob. Someone else. Yeah, Cam. It's not a very clear thought, but I was just thinking about the first reading. And I, I think in life we're called to do things or we, we think we might be called to do something but we're not quite sure. So at least in my experience, I've stepped out and have hope that it's God's will and I've asked for light and clarity and all that. And you kind of, you go on and then you wonder, well, did I make the right decision or well, maybe not, you know. And that precipitates a whole train of emotion and a whole train of thinking that's pretty negative. And, and it is, um, consistent with the kind of thinking and emotion that's present when there's quarreling between people. It's not peaceful, it's not good, it's not open, it's not kind, it's not generous, it's nothing like the spirit that Paul talks about in the second reading. And I, what I take from the first reading is, like, we, we will get brought to the point where we will experience thirst, and even terror as they looked at the, the Red Sea and the, the soldiers running by them. I mean, it was scary. But we're asked to trust and to put our confidence in God and move forward. Yeah, and uh, 
it's, it's, it's hard to do that, but I think there's a piece that comes in with investing companies and trust them. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, if you're ever in that situation where you don't know what to pray and you're just really desperate, a prayer of surrender is one of the best things you can possibly do. And a really simple one is I take refuge in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Just repeat that over and over again, and it brings a surprising amount of relief. Uh, because we will inevitably find ourselves in situations like the desert. Pursuing us, and we don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah, Trent. Um, my father has a, a favorite story of him. He was alone in a McDonald's in Halifax one day, and he, at the next table there was a looked like a grandfather and a little boy, probably Henry's age, sitting with him. And the, the grandfather said to the, the grandson. grandson looked at his grandfather and said, you can't make me. And the grandfather said, now, please eat your french fries. He said, no, you can't make me, and you're not the boss of me. And my father tells that story because, although I never met the, the grandfather, I don't think my father did either, he was the chief justice of Nova Scotia. <laughs> <laughs> so he had the power to put people in prison for long trials and hearings and so on. And I think, to me, when you're speaking about authority, um, I, I guess in the law, we understand authority um, to come more from the office. It's the way they talk about uh, the President of the United States and the office of the President. And so that um, the authority really comes from, just as you were saying, the authority comes from God through faith and prayer. The authority that even secular judges have over really comes from their office and whether he or she is sitting as it were, so is in that right place uh, and applying the correct factors, just as if, if we were talking about uh, authority that we are granted, we would probably want to be able to claim it or call upon it if, uh, if we were to know what Jesus says. There's actually at least two forms of two ways of understanding uh, authority is functioning. One is uh, positional authority, then it's relational authority. That there, there, there's the authority that people have simply because of the personal relationship we have. We trust, basically. We, we trust them. Then there's positional authority, which is the authority of the, the office, the kind that comes with the office. Interestingly, uh, the positional authority, one of the things that is quite noticeable about it, and, and you can really recognize it, is the ritual uh, around it to kind of make that power evident in, in a kind of um, visual experiential space. So with the U.S. president, for example, all of these elaborate rituals around the coronation of the president. Oh, no, no, it's not a king. It's not a coronation. It's just simply, you know, it, it, it's just simply it's oath of office and so on. Well, okay, it's an oath of office that takes all day long, you know, and not only is it the oath itself, there's the balls, there's the, all these rituals that, that encompass it. And I, and I hate to say it, but, um, you know, this position has a bit of that ritualized power and authority, right? I mean, there's the way the clergy dress differently. There's the way that, you know, there's all these little rituals. Like, when I came here, there was a special service to sort of consecrate the beginning of my ministry here. You know, there's all these ritualized things. Uh, the author, uh, uh, Foucault, he has uh, quite a bit to say about this, and he noted that also in school, in the military, in healthcare, you also see the ritualized performance of the granting of authority happen. And in particular, in the case of of medicine, you talked about the procedures around how uh, someone is examined, right? But there's a lot of ritual around the examination practice that's done by a doctor. Uh, but we could go through, I mean, courts, same thing, you know, there's, there's so much ritualization about the judge, you know, the judge comes in, everybody stands, and, and so on. Yeah, so those are all positional. So I think Sarah had a question. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to maybe um, ask about the trust. The word trust is maybe means different things to different people. And I don't think it's an open enough word in people's, I don't know what word I would replace it with, but I, I mean, it means the same thing as a musician, especially leader of people. There's always this idea you have of how things should be. And, and, there's all, and then you come to the part where you actually have to present and you have to make this leap from what you wanted in your head to what, you're going to get and almost always it's 
something you would never think of, and it could be absolutely stunning. So it's it's like you can't. There's there's something. I maybe it's about letting go, because trust feels like an action that you should do, but really it's more about release. I think. Um, I was thinking about this idea of authority and how, and I'm sure it's the same for many other people. That in, in my field, authority is something that you earn, um, and but it's also something that's culturally endowed. So a person who's considered an expert. When you really think about well, how do they become considered that expert? Well, maybe they publish too many important papers, or maybe they know all the right people, or, or whatever. But in my field, everyone's supposed to be equal. So whether you're a student, or a postdoc, or a professor, you should all have the ability to move your ideas forward through the literature. But that's not always what's received. And, and I'm thinking of how the, the prostitutes and the tax collectors, how they bleed. And how it's, it's so important to think, to listen to all the voices democratically to, and try to let go of our cultural perception of authority because the old guys don't always have it right. Great, thank you. So you're saying that in the kingdom there's this thing about the uh, hearing the voices of even the sort of most despised, the prostitution, the tax collectors, and the graduate students. Yeah. Say you have something with St. Jerome in the back that I was re reading yeah. before, and yeah. I didn't know anything until I read it this morning, but how he wasn't such a nice guy. Yeah, St. Jerome was not such a nice guy, but, but he's a saint. But yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, sainthood is clearly not about perfection. No. <laughs> Someone else has something to share about authority and how it functions in God's kingdom. I think Jesus had a lot to say about it. Um, you know, this is not the only passage in Scripture that you can take uh, for that. Uh, for example, you know, Jesus talks about how you know them by their fruit, and that, that whole thing connects to this fig tree passage, and has made me think about how, you know, in terms of whom we give authority to in our in, in God's kingdom, um, you know, in, in sort of church land, in when we're trying to do God's will, who do we pay attention to? Well, I think one of the first things we do is we we look to the fruit that's been borne by. I'm not saying that you know a big church means anything. I'm talking about a sort of spiritual fruit, and we know that when we see it. Most of us, I think, you know, we, in the presence of a holy person, we often feel that holiness. We see how the light of the blessings of many. So. Maybe one more comment. Someone like to share about authority. Um, actually, it was the. <coughs> it wasn't so much a comment. It was what what I think that conflict between how we have to work. To accept God's authority over our work, and I think the the ending of the epistle is just wonderful because you know we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling, so we're taking it really, really seriously. We're not, you know, just taking it for granted. We're we're working, mm -hmm. but it is God who's working in us, enabling us to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's always that you know kind of that balance. Um, it's always there. And, um, you know, the prostitutes and tax collectors took it seriously. And I feel that that's the <laughs> Yeah, okay, so faithfulness has these two senses that we usually use the word, right? There's one sense in which we say that someone is full of faith, and what we mean is they're full of belief, or they're full of kind of holy confidence or something. But there's another way in which we say faithfulness, and what we mean is that they're diligent. That they, they sort of uh, have been faithful to the work, they've been working kind of hard or something, right? That faithfulness. And uh, I think that it's those two things together, actually, right? And you get that absolutely in the Philippians passage. Um, and in her uh, reflections ahead of today, uh, uh, Jamie said on, on the website about how uh, she's really struck by this, uh, this thing about working out on salvation, fear and trembling. And I know, and, and to be honest, it scares the Jesus out of me, right? I mean, there's this sense that, that wait, what, what do you mean? You know, I've got to work out my salvation fear and trembling. That's not, you know, uh, when I feel like it and occasionally. That's fear and trembling, right? That's a pretty sharp demand that's put on us. Um, but do we have any other choice, you know, as, as people? No, I don't think so. I think we're constantly drawn into that 
work of, of salvation. It's beautiful. I think.